Well, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are around the world. Thanks for joining us today to this uh, international IFA International Committee sponsored webinar. Uh, my name is uh, Larry Weinberg. I'm a franchise lawyer in Toronto, Canada, by definition, an international franchise lawyer. And I am chair of the IFA International Committee, and I'm joined today by my co-chair, Kay Ainsley. Kay, give a little wave. And we are uh, welcoming you to this, the second International Committee sponsored webinar. Uh, there were over 100 people registered for this event today, so we're really happy to see that. And great that people in IFA uh, who are members, et cetera, want to learn more about international franchising. Uh, those of you who are on our international committee, uh, please stick around. Remember to stick around after the end of this event uh, webinar as we are having a short uh, international committee meeting. And uh, now I'll move on to introducing our speakers today around with the, providing a business and legal update of, of events around the world. Uh, first, we have Liz Dillon. Liz is a partner in the Minneapolis office of Lathrop GPM, uh, a very seasoned uh, U.S. franchise lawyer with lots of experience taking U.S. brands around the world. Uh, our second speaker is Bill Edwards. Uh, Bill is, uh, well, I've known Bill at least 20 years because it was about 20 years ago or more that we were on the opposite sides of a deal involving a negotiation of a master franchise agreement for Canada. And I represented the master and Bill represented the franchisor. And we got to know each other then. And uh, he's, uh, he's good at what he does, which is taking brands from the U.S. around the world. So I'm going to turn it over to Liz and Bill and uh, enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Okay. Maybe we could get people to mute. Uh, sounds like we got a little bit going on. I'm Bill Edwards, as Larry said, I uh, help US franchises go to other countries. Uh, I'm proud to be here today for a franchising around the globe update, business and legal with my partner, Liz Dillon. Uh, we will take questions at the end of this, or you can put them in the chat or you can email us. Uh, First, a caveat, uh, the information you're gonna to see today from a business standpoint is based on research from a variety of sources and uh, tapping into franchise executives in over 20 countries. Uh, if you don't agree with what we have to say, that's okay. And you wanna give us your feedback and your ideas and thoughts about various countries, we'd greatly appreciate that. Uh, Lauren, could I have the next slide, please? So our agenda is to look at some trends that we see going on in global franchise development, some opportunities and challenges, uh, regional business and legal update, and then uh, we'll end up with a one slide about where we see uh, some really good potential uh, going forward in the next couple of years. Next slide, please. So an in some interesting things that we see going on are around the world, not just in the U.S., are the uh, the entry of multi-unit, multi-brand franchisees, which the, the Brits call mumbos. I love the word mumbos, multi-unit, multi-brand franchisees. Uh, for example, the Phoenix Salon Suites UK licensee also owns Snap Fitness and Subway franchises. So that's the common thing. And then, of course, there's the gigantic Flynn Group, which is a U.S.-based franchisee of a number of major brands uh, with over 2,000 units. And they just took on the rights to open uh, almost 200 Wendy's in Australia. We also see that uh, some of the franchisors are buying back their international licenses, such as Home Instead, Senior Care, and Neighborly in the U.K. that have bought back the licensees, from the licensees, their operations. And then, of course, we have the platform franchisors. The, the really big ones, such as Inspire Brands, uh, which is Arby's and a whole lot of others. And then, of course, we have something like uh, Catherine Monson is the CEO of Propel Brands, which is an interesting mixture of fast signs, salon suites, and nerds to go. Next slide, please. So one of the things I'm finding around the world is a post-pandemic move 
of consumers and people from corporate jobs to wanting to own their own business. And of course, this is resulting in a lot of people buying franchises. I was just in Australia a couple of weeks ago where the they're, they're looking at more interest in franchise development despite the laws and regulations in franchising than they've ever seen before because they were shut down for a couple of years during pandemic and a lot of people were furloughed or lost their corporate jobs. And they're saying, we don't really want to be at the beck and call of a corporation. We want to own our own business. Consumers continue to be open to new franchise brands from other countries. This is, of course, very important for those of us who are exporting franchises. Uh, we continue to find uh, countries where they're open to foreign brands. But some country, some economies are thriving, some not so much. Uh, if you look in the European Union, as we'll see a little later, uh, the one that's growing so fast in franchising right now is Spain, and we'll come back to that. But in what's now called Central Europe, because of the war, not so much. Capital availability is still high. We find that this is uh, not really a limitation to new franchising or going into other countries. And Lauren, can I have the next slide? Of course, we do have some challenges. And one of those, of course, is interest rates. You know, we've gone from almost zero interest rate uh, in making new investments to some countries were working in 18% uh, percent or more. But of course, that means that it makes it that much harder to, to decide to make an investment or to make money on an investment. And guess what? Not just in, in our home country here in the U.S., but all over the world, governments are increasing regulations. And it seems to be they're increasing regulations on small business, i.e. franchises. And of course, elections bring uncertainty and changing policy. So if you're, a, if you're a, a, a company looking to develop a franchise and you're trying to do a business plan for the next three to five years and you've got elections going on, it very often now we're seeing elections of groups that come in and make big changes to the investment client. And that really plays havoc with trying to plan, grow a franchise and a business in a country. Uh, and then of course, there are what I call the trade issues, which uh, some countries are putting up barriers to entry for foreign companies. We'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the countries. And that makes it less easy to do business across borders. And of course, wars. Who would have believed that we would be in, in 2023 watching German tanks move across Europe? That doesn't, uh, that doesn't help with uh, investment being made in new franchises and investment Senate. Nevertheless, let's go to the next slide. This is a uh, this is a projection based on uh, the global view concept that our company has been issuing quarterly on forty companies countries since early two thousands. But it's based on a lot of information as far as where there's uh, good franchise growth going on. Note that uh, there is in the U.S. despite the the interest rates and other regulation uh, and. Australia is just booming with new franchise development. The biggie in the Middle East is Saudi Arabia, and we'll come back to that. But even in Europe, we've got some red countries, uh, Italy, Spain, and the UK, despite what you might read in the news. Green countries are seeing a moderate level of, in, of new investment. Yellow countries, not so much. And then blue countries, not viable. We'll talk about those as we go through the regions. But you can see there's red and green, which is good for new franchise development. Uh, and we're going to cover the, these countries with the, starting with the next slide, Lauren. Some of you have seen our Global View chart. This is where we've taken about 20 countries here that are franchise, generally franchise friendly. And look at some uh, categories here like GDP growth. GDP growth is important because the more the better the growth is, the more new investment there is. By the way, a, a one is good and a four is bad. Uh, legal and regulatory concerns, we'll let uh, Liz will take care of that. 
overall ease of doing business and international brand entry are important and then political and ex- economic stability. But if you're looking to develop your franchise in other countries, the column you want to look at is called ease of finding investors. Uh, one is good. Uh, three is not so good. But anyway, this is kind of a general uh, ranking overall of a few parameters. You could look at many more parameters. And you'll notice that Spain and Indonesia, Philippines near the top. Uh, Japan is a surprise, and we'll talk about that. Uh, China used to be in the top 10%. China is now in the bottom 10%. It's uh, getting very difficult to find investors in China that want to make new investments. Next. So let's start with North America. Uh, and, and these are going to be kind of general statements, of course, but uh, the U.S. continues to see good franchise growth despite high interest rates and increased government, uh, I'll call it interference rather than regulation, relative to other markets. One of the interesting ones is Mexico. If you look at the news every night, you'd see that you think the country is about to collapse and everybody's being shot and there's nothing going on. But in fact, there's an awful lot of interest in new franchise development. Canada remains conservative about new investment, but it's definitely seeing new franchise investment. Next slide, please. Liz? Thanks, Phil. Um, For the legal update for North America, I'll be focusing on um, my neighbor to the north, Canada. There's been a lot of activity in Canada recently with changes in a couple laws that impact all businesses, including franchisors. First, I'll cover recent amendments to the Canadian Competition Act, which now prohibit no poach agreements. For some context, no poach agreements are an agreement between unaffiliated employers not to solicit or hire employees. This has certainly been a hot topic in the U.S. the last few years, and it continues to be. Um, Draft guidelines were published in January of this year, and in May, the final guidelines were officially published, and they came into force in June. Notably for franchisors, and some good news, In the final guidelines, franchise agreements were included on the list of agreements where the Bureau will generally not pursue criminal investigations unless a no poach is broader than necessary, meaning it's too long of a duration or it applies to too broad of um, employees. This only applies to new agreements going forward, and so existing agreements are not required to be formally terminated or amended with franchisees, but franchisors still need to be careful. If the parties engage in conduct that implements these existing no poach agreements and franchise agreements, they could be liable. So franchisors really should be discussing these changes with their Canadian council, um, update their form franchise agreement if necessary, and then talk about how to handle it for the existing agreements. There also has been a couple cases out of Canada recently that emphasize, uh, for me, that franchisors really need to be careful when relying on the narrow exemptions provided under provincial franchise laws. In the Brownies food case out of British Columbia, a franchisor relied on the exemption for the sale of a franchise to an existing franchisee when there was not a material change in the information provided. In this case, the franchisor offered a franchise under the same terms as the existing franchise agreement, but the existing franchisees of affiliate was the franchisee on the new franchise agreement. Because the affiliate was the franchisee and not the entity on the original franchise agreement, even though ownership was very similar, the franchisor could not rely on the exception. In another case, there was a rescission case out of Ontario where the franchisee purchased an existing franchise restaurant from a franchisee and the franchisor did not provide disclosure. It pointed to an exemption from disclosure under the Arthur Richard Act for transfers if the grant of a franchise was not affected by or through a franchisor. But the Ontario courts have interpreted this exemption very narrowly, finding only indirect involvement is allowed and only when it is required for consent. And in this case, the court found much more involvement. The franchisor required the franchisee to sign a new franchise agreement, and provided the franchisee with information about the franchise. Franchisors need to exercise caution and remember to view these exemptions and other exemptions under provincial franchise laws very narrowly. Finally, in Canada, we'll move um, out east to Quebec. Bill 
96, as it's called, amended Quebec's French language charter and now requires the use of French in all commercial contracts. Contracts. So what does this mean for franchisors going into Quebec? Franchisors must now translate their franchise agreements and all ancillary agreements, like a software license agreement, into French. It must be the agreement that will actually be signed by the franchisee. You can't just translate the form and then modify the English version for a particular transaction. Well, there are exceptions to this if, if the franchise agreement is not considered a contract of adhesion. Given Quebec's case law, most, if not all, franchise agreements will likely be deemed contracts of adhesion, so franchisors should be prepared to translate their franchise agreements going forward. Notably, franchisors may not pass the cost of translation onto the franchisees. Next slide, please. Bill? Okay, well, let's go down into the Americas now. In Central America, continues to see an uh, impact of the pandemic on new investment. Uh, it hasn't really recovered. Most of those countries were not high GDP per capita to begin with, and the pandemic hit them very hard. Uh, and some of the poor economic conditions are due to policies by governments that are, to put it bluntly, not pro-business. Uh, an interesting development is Brazil. Uh, Brazil, several months ago, uh, brought in a left-leaning uh, president who was supposed to be non-business, non, non, not favorite to for, favorable to business, but in actual fact, they, they're beginning to pass some policies that are going to uh, lower the amount of complexity that it, that's required to do business in Brazil. Currently in Brazil, it, uh, according to the World Bank, there's 189 steps to forming a business, a new business, and takes 45, 45 to 90 days to open a new business, where in the United States, you can start a corporation in 15 minutes online. Uh, the other thing, though, that we need to be aware of in Brazil is that about 95% of the franchises are local. So trying to bring foreign brands into Brazil has always been a bit of a challenge. Peru and Chile have had uh, major government policy problems. That's a good way to put it, uh, with which has limited interest in new investment. But we think the uh, corner's been turned in Chile, and it's becoming more positive for business investment. And then we get to Argentina. I believe the latest number for Argentina is 133% inflation this year. When you have inflation at that level, you don't have a lot of new franchise development going on. You have a lot of money leaving the country. Next slide, please. For the legal updates in this region of the world, I'm going to focus on Brazil. Um, as Bill mentioned, there's been some regulatory changes there that have eased doing business for foreign franchisors. And one of the bigger changes that I've noticed in the last year has been a change in Brazil's foreign currency controls that really will make it easier for franchisors to get money out of Brazil. And that is just fantastic news. So previously, franchisors had to record their signed, translated international franchise agreements with the Brazilian IP office. And then once recorded, they had to then file with the Brazilian central bank in order to get money out of the country. And that process took some time. But due to a change in the law that went into effect in December of 2022, it's much simpler now and foreign franchisors who want to be paid royalties or initial fees or other amounts no longer have to register with the Brazilian Central Bank. And it may actually, although we're still trying to figure this out, but it may actually avoid having to register even with the Brazilian IP office since that was a step that was really just taken to be able to register with the Brazilian Central Bank and get money out. Now, I will say anecdotally, some commercial banks are still requiring their certificate of recording from the Brazilian IP office as they're kind of getting new, used to and adjusting to the new law. But we expect that to ease as, you know, um, in this coming year. Next slide, please. Phil? Well, if I, if I could go back to Brazil for just a minute. Sure. Uh, in the past, it's sometimes taken 12 to 18 months from the time you sign a license agreement till you get paid your license fee because of having to go through all the government regulation. This change doesn't sound like a big deal until you think about that. This is gigantic for Brazil, actually, as far as making money out of franchising. Let's go to the European Union. And of course, we have to separate out the United Kingdom these days. 
Uh, but Spain, Italy, and the United Kingdom, we're seeing really good interest in new franchise development. If you look, if you look at the news in the UK, the world is coming to an end economically. But in fact, uh, our folks are seeing a number of license agreements being done. Spain has the lowest unemployment in the European Union. And the biggest challenge right now in Spain is finding locations for all the new franchise restaurants that want to open up. Uh, that's a that's a, a nice problem to have. Of course, Central Europe has been impacted by the war. Uh, your countries like the Czech Republic, Hungary, and Poland, and to some extent Germany, are a little hesitant. People a little hesitant to make new investments because of the war to the east and also government policies. Next slide, please. Liz. Next. Yeah, next slide, Lauren. That's, I think, oh, oh, oh I'm going delayed. to go back one, back one. There you go. Oh, there you go. Um, so for my updates, I'm going to focus on three countries that have an update, Italy, Poland, and the Netherlands. Um, in Italy, in there's been a trend by the Italians antitrust authority bringing actions against franchisors. So this case stems out of an action brought in 2020 against the retail company Benetton, the clothing company that arise from a complaint by a former franchisee that is based on an abuse of economic dependence under Italy's antitrust laws. So in order for the franchisee to prove economic dependence, it must show that there's an excessive imbalance of rights and obligations in its commercial relationship and that there are no alternatives in the market. In this case, the Italian antitrust authority focused on contract terms in the franchise agreement that they found unjustifiably or, or um, challenging for the franchisee. But actually many of these terms were pretty typical for franchise agreements. But what happened is Benetton actually settled the case in January of this year and agreed to modify its franchise agreement, including narrowing the termination rights and removing minimum purchase obligations, and even added the obligation on Benetton to buy back certain assets at termination. And this case is very similar to a case brought by the Italian antitrust authorities against McDonald's and other franchisors in recent years. And what's notable is all these cases were resolved by the franchisor agreeing to modify their agreement terms. And what's actually happened is that this approach has given the Italian antitrust authority the power to rewrite franchise agreements and rebalance those agreements in a way that they feel is fair, mm -hmm. which is not actually a right given to them under the law. Moving on to Poland, uh, recently the Poland Ministry of Justice proposed a franchise law that would require pre-sale disclosure, but that obligation to provide disclosure would extend beyond the initial sale and apply to any modifications of the agreement. And failure to disclose allows a franchisee the right to terminate for one year. This law also would limit a franchisor's ability to terminate the franchise agreement. For example, it may only terminate for failure to pay if they've missed two payment periods, which internationally can be a long time if you're only getting paid monthly or even quarterly. And the proposed law also impacts a franchisor's ability to enforce, enforce post-term non-competes, only allowing for a non-compete ban for the operation of a competing franchise system, not the business itself. So this law, this proposal is not into law yet. It's got a long way to go, but we'll be keeping an eye on that. Finally, moving on to the Dutch franchise law. As many of you probably know, the Dutch franchise law went into effect in 2021, but there was a two-year transition period for certain elements of the law that applied to existing franchise agreements that were signed before the 2021 effective date. And these are provisions govern the franchise relationships itself and include consent rights, non-compete clauses, and value determination upon contract termination. The impact now is if a franchisor fails to amend their agreements with franchisees to be compliant with the Dutch franchise law, there might be significant consequences, including losing the ability to force any non-compete or seek damages. So if you have franchisees in the Netherlands and you haven't amended your existing franchise agreements, that were signed before 2021, we, we strongly encourage you to reach out to Dutch Council and determine the best next steps. Next slide. All right, now we're in Africa and the Middle East, uh, which is of course a very large area. Probably the number one fastest growing franchise country, uh, development country in the world right now is Saudi Arabia. 
it's seeing immense new development across uh, a variety of sectors, pr primarily food and beverage. Uh, there is a new franchise law, which Liz will talk about. There's very rapidly growing consumer demand. And of course, there's available capital. Capital is not a problem. Uh, there are also uh, a lot of uh, uh, changes going on in the country. Uh, we took a uh, Southern California seafood brand into Saudi Arabia last fall. And when I showed up for the grand opening, uh, there were in the restaurant three waitresses. There's never been waitresses in a restaurant in Saudi Arabia until now. Uh, that's a gigantic change. Uh, they're not anywhere near as uh, as modern as we are, but it, there are changes going on. The United Arab Emirates is a very big tourist area for those of you who know it. Uh, that's where all the uh, people from the, around that region go to uh, to have a good time. French, uh, foreign franchises do well, but it's really becoming saturated with brands. And so that's why I think we're seeing a lot of development in Saudi right next door because there's still a lot of open territory. Of course, most of Africa is limited in new franchise development due to corruption, economic and political challenges, and frankly, a low GDP per capita uh, buying power. Uh, one of the uh, difference, one of the uh, unusual ones there is Kenya, which is the little yellow thing, little yellow country down in the bottom right or middle right there, where which is more modern and seeing more uh, franchise development. And then up in the top left, the little green area is Morocco. And of course, this was map was put together prior to the huge earthquake. But Morocco has seen a lot of new foreign franchise development in the last couple of years. Next slide, please. Okay, moving on to a couple of legal items to keep aware of in the region. As Bill said, their Saudi Arabia has a franchise law. It's been in place for a couple of years now. A lot of franchisors have been navigating it. It, re it requires disclosure and registration. And by all accounts, while expensive to comply with, it's it's the registration process has been going fairly smoothly. And so that's been welcome news. Um, and other welcome news, there was a favorable amendment to the franchise law in Saudi Arabia that actually removed the obligation to disclose information related to the franchisor's financials. So previously, franchisors had to include two years of financial statements, and they no longer have to do that. Um, and I they, that change was made to make it easier for franchisors to register and do business in Saudi Arabia. I've also recently seen a couple of uh, reports out of Nigeria that a franchise bill was passed there. And the key elements of the bill include delivery of a disclosure document, registration of a franchise agreement, and ensuring that at least 20% of business inputs come from Nigeria. So if you are looking at expanding into that country, it's worth looking into to see at the status of that law. Next slide. Well, we're going really fast through the world here. Now we're in India. Uh, it's, it, of course, is has a lot of interest in new franchise brands, but it remains a challenging place to actually sign and operate licenses successfully. Uh, my saying about India is it's not another country, it's another universe. Uh, it's one thing to get the licensee to sign the agreement. It's another thing to get them to follow the business system. But it is such a huge market, uh, even the middle class being several hundred million people, that it's hard to ignore and there is a lot of interest in foreign brands. Other countries in the region, uh, such as Pakistan, have severe economic and political challenges and are not all that easy to do business in, to put it bluntly. Uh, let's go to the next slide. For my update here in this region of the world, I'll be focusing on India uh, and the Indian there was a recent court case out of India that really brought home a point that we often tell our clients, which is don't ignore formalities when franchising abroad. They're important. And so what happened is in April of 2023, the Supreme Court of India called into question the enforceability of an arbitration clause in an agreement. And so under Indian law, parties are required to pay a stamp duty when certain agreements are signed, and those generally include franchise agreements. And the court found that if the par parties did not pay that stamp duty, which is not expensive, 
that agreement ha and that agreement has an arbitration clause, that whole agreement wouldn't be enforceable, including the requirement to arbitrate, which would require any dispute then to be settled in court. So an appeal has been filed, but it may take time to run its way through the court system. So in the meantime, it's worth checking your existing franchising agreements in India, make sure all these formalities have been followed that the uh, and that the stamp duty has been paid. Um, India also released a draft privacy law in November of 2022. We're still far away from that being finalized. But if enacted, there are provisions that restrict overseas data transfers, which obviously then impact a franchisor's ability to get certain data out of India. Next slide, please. Going back to India for just a second, uh, you what what Liz told you about arbitration is extraordinarily important there because uh, it takes ten anywhere from ten to fifteen years to go through the court system in India. And I think McDonald's, which had a battle going on between its northern licensee and its southern licensee, it was about 10 years before the court case was settled. And that's kind of a hard, long time to wait to get your uh, get your franchise back. Well, now we're going to go into uh, into the uh, it, it should say the Far East, not the Near East uh, up the top. Uh as I mentioned earlier, Australia is seeing a very, very, very strong franchise development. The franchise development companies there say they've never seen as much interest in franchising. And this is despite the rather onerous laws and regulations that Liz is going to tell you about in a few minutes. Uh, one of the interesting things that's going on is a development in Japan. Uh, Japan has had lots of franchise development, but uh, what we're seeing now is some of the very old companies, which were pretty staid and not look, not really very modern, are now looking at new brands to bring into the country uh, to revitalize their business and and really looking at new and different things. This is a this is a change in Japan, and we're we're seeing some really good development. Now let's go to China. Um, China probably is somewhere between a, uh, a yellow and a blue right now. Uh, there is very little interest in uh, new franchise development. If you're a McDonald's or, or KFC or Starbucks that have, or Pizza Hut that have thousands of units already in China, there's still good development going on, especially in, this, in the smaller third and fourth tier cities. But if you're a far a, a new brand trying to get established, you're going to have trouble finding investors. The, the, the Chinese investors don't really know what their government is going to do. They they one day they they hear that the government wants to encourage new investment. The next day they're clamping down on small business. So as a result, the uh, the amount of investor interest in China is the lowest I've seen in decades. Uh, on the other hand, you've got the Philippines and Indonesia, very active with new franchise development. Uh, Indonesia, I think, will grow at about 5% this year, and Philippines at about 7 uh, Both of them have pro-growth governments. Uh, and, of course, the Philippines has more U.S. food and beverage brands, I think, per capita than any other country than the United States. Uh, in Indonesia, the consumer uh, buying power is going up and they buy at Western brands. Korea remains hampered by onerous franchise sector regulation, some of which is very is anti-foreign brand, and uh, has a it's a real challenge. Uh, one of my friends in Korea said that the U.S. restaurant brands there have the shortest half-life of any country. They they go in, they go up, and they go down within a few years. It's a, it's a challenging market, although there's a lot of high GDP per capita consumers. But then we come to New Zealand, sitting down in the bottom right there, a country of about 5 million people, uh, no franchise laws, but a strong code of ethics. They consider themselves to be the most franchised country on the face of the earth, more franchise locations per capita than any other country, but it's a small market, but there's definitely interest. Next slide, please. Thanks, Bill. Um, 
As Bill alluded to, this region of the world is very highly regulated. Nearly every country that Bill mentioned has its own franchise law and is can be very challenging to franchise in. Um, you know, Korea, China, Vietnam, Malaysia, all those countries have these their own franchise regulations. So for purpose of, of this webinar, I'm going to focus on some changes that have been coming out of Australia and New Zealand. So Australia has its franchise law. It's been around for a while, but they in August of this year, they announced that they will be doing a review of the Franchising Code of Conduct, which is their franchise law. And so the last time it was reviewed a couple of years ago, it resulted in significant changes to that law and additional disclosure obligations. And we do anticipate that that could ha potentially happen again. This review is expected and because the current law is set to sunset in 2025. So this law is kind of part of the normal process, but it, but it will be happening. And I also wanted to just remind folks that it's been about a year since the Australian Franchise Registry went live. So in that is a registration process that all franchisors in Australia have to do. Um, I think there is an exception if you're a master and uh, you only grant one license, but otherwise you have to register, enter information into the registry. You don't have to update your disclosure document, but there's quite a bit of information that is in your disclosure document on that registry. So if you haven't done that yet, make sure you're looking to do that soon. Um, in New Zealand, there is no franchise law, but they did in the last um, little over a year extend their prohibitions on unfair contract terms to apply to small trade contracts in addition to consumer contracts. So small trade contracts in New Zealand are those business arrangements worth less than $250,000 a year for goods and services. So really most franchise agreements would be considered small trade contracts and have to comply with this unfair contract term legislation. So this applies to any agreements that are signed or modified after mid-August of 2022. And courts, when they look to consider if a franchise agreement term is unfair, they'll look at if the term causes a significant imbalance in rights and obligations, the term is reasonably necessary to protect a franchisor's interest, and if the term would cause injury to a party. And we're still waiting for some guidance from the Commerce Commissioner on, on how these will be applied. But in the meantime, franchisors need to be aware that this is out there because franchisees can apply to a court for a declaration that a term in an agreement is unfair. And if the court agrees, the franchisor won't be able to enforce that term and may also be liable for fines or damages. Around the same time, New Zealand also legislated unconscionable conduct, which applies to both the contract terms and the party's contract conduct outside of the agreement. And while that term isn't defined in reviewing franchise relationship, a court is instructed to consider the bargaining power of the parties, if the parties acted in good faith, if the franchise or acted reasonably to protect its interest, and if unfair pressure was used. And similarly to the prohibition unfair contract terms, there's potential for penalties and fines. So franchising is a um, remain strong in New Zealand, but just be aware that some of the, what we would think of as more typical franchise agreement terms may be considered unfair contract terms under the new New Zealand law. Uh, we're still waiting a little bit to see how it plays out. Next slide. If I could, it, it, let's, let's leave it here for a second. Uh, a couple of comments. When I was in Australia, I did talk to some of the franchise lawyers and, uh, you know, they say, yes, their laws and regulations are onerous, but people are still buying franchises. So they've they've learned to work with even joint employer challenges down there. Uh, one of the things I wanted to mention about Indonesia is several years ago, Indonesia tried to put in place a rule that uh, before you could bring a food product into the country, uh, you had to try to produce it locally. And of course, this meant that you had to use uh, use the, the lean mean machine uh, cattle that they had rather, or water buffalo they had rather than beef if you wanted to make uh, Carl's Juniors or McDonald's burgers. Uh, that's still a challenge, but uh, we're apparently the U.S. especially is winning a number of cases now to for foreign brand for American brands to bring uh, food products into the country. Next slide, please. So where to look for new growth in 24, 25? Uh, of course, this is very subjective and uh, everybody probably has their own countries that they want to add, subtract, multiply or divide from this list. 
I personally think that because of the changes in Brazil that Liz mentioned, uh, that we may see more foreign brands start to enter the country. Uh, it, it's easier to do a license agreement. Uh, and the, uh, the very leftist government is actually pro-low business regulation, which is probably an oxymoron, but it, it actually seems to be working. I, I think that the problems that we've had in Chile the last few years with, again, uh, a government that was not pro-business are changing and that Chile will once again become a really good market for foreign brands. Mexico, it continues to amaze me that despite all the things you read in the newspaper and on the new, here on the news at night, there are companies in Mexico wanting to make new franchise investments. Then if we go to Europe, uh, France is seeing good investment. We, we think that Hungary will start to want more investment, even though it's near to the war. Uh, Italy, it's, Italy is, as most of you know, is two countries. Italy is the North, which is very business professional focused, and the South, which is very unionized. And in the North, there's a good bit of investment going on. I think you'll also see uh, more in, more interest in Poland. There's an election coming up very shortly, and it should be a pro-business outcome. Spain continues to amaze us. Uh, the really big problem in Spain is finding enough locations to open all the franchises that people have paid for. As we go to Middle and Near East, we've talked about India. Saudi Arabia shows every sign of continuing to be the biggest growth area in the region of new brands. Uh, we personally took a, a franchise in there in the last year. They went through the law process. I was all worried about that. It was just about as slick as it could possibly be. Now that was paying for expensive lawyers, <clears throat> but uh, it actually worked and there was no funny business. It was, it, the process went, worked. Our biggest challenge was getting the U.S. State Department to do the attestation and notarization of the documents. They were all working from home. That's another story. Uh, Asia Pacific, Australia, Indonesia, Japan. Malaysia has uh, gone through some uh, very strange election problems in recent years, but now it seems to be settling down a bit. And there's signs that new franchise development will accelerate in that market. And of course, New Zealand, Philippines, we've talked about, Thailand, last but certainly not least. Thailand, prior to COVID, was about 35% of its GDP was tourism, went to zero, now it's back. And as tourism comes back, investor sentiment becomes more positive for the future. Well, thank you very much for, uh, did you have another slide, Liz? I think that was it. No, I think we just had a couple of minutes we wanted to reserve for questions. So right. if anyone has any questions they want to ask, feel free to jump in and ask them and we'll do our best to answer them or point to someone else on the call that could do a better job. And we'll uh, we'll get a PDF of this presentation to Alan to be distributed. Uh, if, and mm -hmm. of course, the comments in here, not legal, because those are based on fact. But the other ones are subjective and everybody might, some people might have different opinions on countries. But I think the bottom line is that franchise development, despite all the festivities going on, to the contrary, it are, is alive and well around the world. Thanks, uh, Liz and Bill. That was great. Whirlwind tour of the world. Uh, you know, it's certainly notable to me that the most regulated country in the world is Australia, and it's uh, near the top of your list, Bill. And uh, having been there many times, I can tell you it is very much a a business friendly environment and a very much a um, small business friendly environment. And uh, you know, I, I hope we emulate some of that in Canada where I sit, but uh, certainly Australia is really really good for that. So thanks very much. Uh, I don't see any particular questions I at this point. There's, there's one question in there for us. Do you see an increase okay. in franchisors granting trademark license agreements versus full franchise slash master agreements abroad? Um, I personally have not seen an increase in trying to focus on a more narrow trademark license agreement. I have seen a trend in the last you know five or 10 years. I've seen 
more multi-unit development agreements. Um, uh, I don't want to say more than masters, but I've seen more of them than I did before. So I think there, to me, there seems to be a trend about um, maybe moving away from master franchising as the only alternative abroad to also looking at multi-unit franchising. Bill, what is your experience? I have, I would totally agree with what you said. Yeah, I think that's uh, a lot of multi-unit going on in regional, but uh, otherwise pretty much the same as, as types of agreements as in the past. I'll, I'll just add, I, you know, I get this question a lot about trademark license agreements versus some kind of franchise agreement. And I think the bottom line is it is very unsatisfactory to the trademark brand owner to not be able to exercise the controls. Uh, so people don't want to be um, a franchise, but then they really want a franchise <laughs> is the bottom line. I see a next question about uh, Quebec. Uh, Quebec. And, yeah, Larry, you might be better able to answer this than me, but my understanding yeah, sure. is that translation of the agreements are for agreements signed going forward that yeah, that's, that's don't correct. have to go back and translate an agreement they signed five years ago, right? That's that's correct. It's only new agreements and franchise agreements fall into a bucket of what they call contracts of adhesion, standard form contracts. Mm -hmm. And if and most franchise agreements are presented that way, and that's why they are required to be translated. All right, I think we're at the end of our uh, time here. And so thanks again uh, for our presenters. Uh, if you are a member of the International Committee, please stay on our Zoom call here as we're gonna have a, a short meeting. If you are uh, otherwise uh, just attending for fun, uh, and there were more than 60 people who registered, or sorry, who attended this today, so that's fantastic. Uh, thanks for sticking around, but class is, uh, your class is dismissed. And so we'll give you a minute to uh, depart and then we'll start our international committee meeting. Lots of thank yous for Liz and Bill.